So let's get started. Yeah, welcome to the ELD MOOC. Welcome to this afternoon's session on ecosystem services and stakeholders. I am Claudia Musekamp and I am the online tutor uh, for this MOOC and I will be guiding you through this afternoon's session. Um, the session will be about an hour long. Um, we will have a presentation and afterwards uh, we would like you to put your question into the chat uh, but we will also open the microphones uh, so that you can um, uh, uh, ask your question in audio and if you have a webcam you may want to switch that on so that we can also see you. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, last assignment. Um, you wrote about the land you value. We received 370 uh, uh, short and big stories and um, we sort of all read them. Yes, uh, among uh, the four of us, yes, we read them and we were very much impressed uh, about uh, the stories you shared with us. And uh, what we can see from uh, your um, stories, what you can see is how much uh, stakeholders, how much you are a stakeholder in the land you value, how much uh, economic value, but also uh, how much heart and soul you're putting into uh, the experience with that uh, land. So today's uh, you so, so with this assignment, uh, you experience what it means to be a stakeholder in your uh, favorite uh, land. And today we learn more about stakeholders in um, uh, in other scenarios, and uh, this will be um, presented by Stacy Knoll. But before I'll uh, hand over to Stacy Knoll, I would like uh, to ask you. Um, you are all working in land management or are interested in land management. Uh, can you tell me oh, uh, which uh, other uh, stakeholders you are working with? Are you working with farmers? Are you working with the business sector, with companies? Are you working with uh, the government or with NGOs or other stakeholders? Um, I've put on the uh, that poll. You just click the button. Which stakeholders are you currently working with, or um, will you be working with? Is that farmers or businesses, the government, or NGOs? I've received half of the of the participants' votes. Please continue showing us, telling us which stakeholders you will be working with. The results just came up on the screen, so a strong group of our participants is working with the government um, a major part, but one fifth, is working with farmers on the local uh, government, uh, on the local level. Uh, some are working with companies, NGOs, a few, and others, uh, which I see in the chat, uh, are others are also a, a mix of farmers or government or um, or researchers. So I see. Uh, 
many of you also presented uh, our local clans in Somaliland from Ms. Muna's reply. So uh, a whole variety of uh, stakeholders uh, to get involved with. Yes, I see. So here you, you have an overview of this of today's group of who is working with who. And um, now I'm very happy to hand over to Stacy Noel, today's speaker. Stacy Noel is a distinguished speaker. I'm very proud to have her on board. She's a director of the Africa Center of the Stockholm Environment Institute, currently based in Nairobi. Uh, St Stacy Noel holds a master's degree from the uh, London School of Economics in Development Management. And uh, she has worked with the United, uh, US uh, Department of State as well as with um, NGO uh, in uh, Belize. So uh, please welcome with me Stacy Noel. Thank you very much, Claudia, and hello to everyone from Bonn. I'm very happy to have you today, and I want to say that I'm very appreciative to the ELD and the GIZ staff here in Bonn for making this uh, technically very easy for me. I'm completely worry-free because I have all these people around to help me. So I'm leading one of the working groups for the Economics of Land Degradation. It's the Pathways for Policy Outreach Working Group. And its goal is to ensure that the ELD research outputs result in policy uptake. So this group, is, this group is focusing on engaging with stakeholders throughout the ELD process. So that's what my talk is going to be about today. Who are the stakeholders? How do we engage them? And in what way do we convey the results from our research to make sure it can be used by these stakeholders? And we're going to take a multi-stakeholder approach. We're going to aim to identify all groups of people that are affected, whether it's directly or indirectly, by land degradation. And before I start, I want to say that obviously a presentation about gathering stakeholder input shouldn't be a long presentation where I talk on and on and you just listen. That would make no sense at all for what I'm trying to do. So what I want to do is share my thoughts on how to go about stakeholder input and engagement, and then I very much look forward to the discussion and to your thoughts on how you would go about it in your region. Um, remember that the ELD is a globally focused initiative, so hearing about what you're doing, who you're working with, how you're going about it, really adds to what our working group is doing, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion here on. So, to start with the stakeholder identification, there's four, four major types, but let me just go over what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the, how we decide who are our stakeholders, then I'll talk briefly about engagement methodologies, and then lastly, one slide about how we tailor our research to reach these different audiences. So, to the next slide. We start with stakeholder identification. There's four major types that you can see here, government, private sector, civil society, and other. So I've separated civil society and other, although in a lot of the literature you'll see them together. I would call other academic and the scientific community. And the reason I've split these up this way is I feel like the way that we reach the academic and the, the research community is very different than how we reach civil society. So that's why I've, I've cut these up these ways, but you'll see in the literature sometimes these last two categories are, are put together. So for government, we're talking about all levels from national to local. For the private sector, we're again looking at, at multiple levels from a large multinational firm to medium-sized national businesses, all the way down to small scale and even micro-enterprises. And for this group, we also include farmers. They're also the private sector for us. And then lastly, civil society. This includes NGOs, community-based organizations, interest groups, organizations. So to go on to the slide that we're on, I do want to say that depending on your project, you might, want to you might not want to include all the scales, all the way from national to local. But I think you would likely want to include all four of the types of organizations. For example, if you're implementing a project and you want to introduce, say, a new soil water management technique in a small watershed, then maybe you don't need national level government and large scale private sector firms. But you might want to involve the local ag extension officer. You want to definitely want to in include the farmers. 
and maybe a small local firm that's selling ag products or any kind of local civil society entities like a farmers cooperative or a women's group and you might be working with a local university so then you'd include the fourth group and of course for a lot of us who are in academics we very much want to write up what we do either in a working paper a policy brief or a journal article so that's another way that you can impact on this last group of stakeholders so now to look at the slide on, on national level government We'll start with, with the national level. There are three levels to look at here. First, I'd say the president or the prime minister's office, which you might have, which might have relevant units that can focus on land issues. Depending on your aim and the scale of your project, you might want to brief someone from this office. As an example, in Tanzania, there's a very high-profile initiative going on right now called the Southern Agricultural Growth Quarter, and the president of Tanzania is very actively involved in promoting this project. So if you had a project that was related to this initiative, or if it might have policy implications for this initiative, then you'd want to start by talking to someone in the president's office. So next are the ministries. If you, Claudia, if you could just go back one, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves here. If you could go back one slide, that would be great. Perfect. So next are the ministries when the issue is land degradation. There's quite a range of ministries that are potentially relevant. I'd say if there's a Ministry of Lands, you should look at its mandate first. In some cases, this ministry might be more involved in tenure and titles, that kind of thing. But it might also be involved in higher level decision making about land use. So that should be the first one to consider. And after that, I'd say management of natural resources at the national level. It could be handled within one ministry, possibly a Ministry of Environment, or more likely it could be split up in multiple ministries. It could be agriculture, there could be one for water, forestry, fisheries, livestock, tourism. With natural resources, they can really be spread across quite a few um, quite quite a few portfolios. And then on the third level, there for agencies, there's quite a few specific agencies that might be relevant. Some might be under a ministry, some might be under a ministry, but but semi-autonomous, and some might be completely independent entities. So you don't want to miss looking at this at these groups. If you've started by looking at the government structure, and then you've talked to people in the relevant ministries you probably already figured out which of these agencies might be relevant to your work. And if you've already started with the ministries, so hopefully they'll have even given you some names or some offices to start with. So now I want to present a country case study to make this process a little bit more con concrete, a little bit more real. I've chosen Kenya for two reasons. First of all, that's where I'm based, so why not? But also because my working group is undertaking stakeholder consultations in Kenya on behalf of the ELD initiative. So working through this, this, relevant, this list of relevant stakeholders in Kenya is, is part of that exercise and part of the start of the process. So when we get into the discussion, if there's anybody out there who's working in Kenya, based in Kenya, or has worked there, I'd welcome any comments you have on the stakeholder analysis. I've only been in Kenya for nine months. I was in Tanzania for five years before that, and I think you might be able to tell that from some of my examples. I have quite a few from Tanzania. So I'm still learning how things are working in Kenya. So to start with the Kenya case study, you can see on this slide some of the relevant national stakeholders for land degradation issues. After the last election, the Kenyan, um, sorry, after the last election, the Kenyan ministries underwent a, a major consolidation. And now there's only one ministry that deals altogether with environment, water, and natural resources. But I think this is kind of unusual. It's been my experience that in many cases, this is split into two or three ministries. Um, in Tanzania, there's no ministry of environment, but there's a ministry for natural resources and tourism. Plus, there's a separate ministry for water and irrigation, and Kenya puts together agriculture, livestock, and fisheries, whereas Tanzania has one ministry for ag and another two for livestock and fisheries. So depending on the focus of your work, you might have to consult with at least two ministries, and maybe even more to make sure that you reach all the relevant government stakeholders. So to go to the next slide, we're going to look at subnational government stakeholders. First, you have the subnational regional entities. They have different names in different countries. They could be regions, they could be states, they could be provinces. Um, in the two, two of the countries where I work, Belize and Tanzania, the regional areas were called districts. So you have to make sure that you're at the, the right level and you're using the right terminology. There are um, also lower level units of government, municipalities and local authorities. At the local level, you'll also find staff from the relevant ministries and the subunits that I mentioned in the earlier slide. And I think these people will be a very valuable resource in terms of understanding what's actually happening on, happening on the ground, and they can also help identify issues that may have been missed in talks with senior officials based in the capital. They can usually identify what major problems and hopefully what opportunities there are for local residents in the community where they're working. Okay. Um, hold on. Yes. So now we're looking at the local government with a Kenya case study. And for the Kenya example, here we want to look at county-level government. 
In the, the 2010 constitution adopted in Kenya used a county structure for the local government. And after the 2013 elections, Kenya devolved authority to 47 counties. So that's the local government that we would want to, the structure we would want to work within in terms of engaging local stakeholders in Kenya. So this includes a county governor and a deputy county governor. And they're the chief executive and the deputy chief for the county and their elected positions. There's also a county commissioner who represents the national government, and this is an appointed position by the national government. And then there are county assemblies, which have legislative powers. So this is the, the group that we would want to work through in Kenya. I think this is actually quite different than you would see in a lot of other countries. Um, there are also lower level authorities. They have city, municipality, and town authorities. And right now there's only three places that have city status in, in Kenya, and that's Nairobi, Mombasa, and Kizumu, for those of you familiar with Kenya. But um, So in Kenya, working with lower level government stakeholders means working within this new county structure. And I think this might be something we could see beyond Kenya. Um, last month in Kenya's Daily Nation newspaper, there was an article about how other African countries are considering the same kind of county structure. Um, to quote the article, it says, Kenya's 2010 constitution, especially the county model based on a two-tier government, is inspiring constitution-making processes from across Africa, from Zimbabwe to Tanzania. So this might be the wave of the future for Africa. I think it's a, an interesting test case to see how it works in Kenya. And it will be interesting when we do our, our local level consultations in Kenya to see how we interact with the county government and how what we hear from them, how it meshes with what we hear from the national level stakeholders. And the same article also talks about how Tanzania is currently redrafting its constitution and they're having the same debate about whether they have want to have one, two, or three levels of government. And there's some argument that this system in Kenya is, is actually quite efficient to only have two levels. So when we have the conversation, when we have a discussion, I would like to hear from people who are working at the local level in their various countries exactly how the structure is in your country and if it makes it easier or harder, and what kind of challenges it presents, and if you see efficiencies in it. So that's something we can talk about when we get to that, um, to that section. So basically, for local government, you might find a variety of arrangements from a highly centralized government structure with limited autonomy at the local levels, to a devolved system like the Kenyan County structure, or countries with three or more levels of government. So identifying the subnational or regional stakeholders will involve first surveying what type of system in the country you're working, and then thinking about which entities you want to engage, which ones are relevant to the work that you're doing. So if we go to the next slide, we're now on to the private sector. And here we also have different levels and scales to consider from multinationals to small and medium enterprises operating in rural areas. Um, for the Kenya case study, you can see here that I've listed a couple of um, large multinationals that are working in, working in bottled beverages. And then there's also large foreign-owned firms in all the major industries, ag and mining and forestry. So these are the ones that you would want to look at in Kenya. For national, there's, uh, Kenya is, is such a vibrant country, such a vibrant economy. There's so many that I could have listed here. But I've given an example of some firms that are working in Sizel, um, tea and coffee and sugar, which are big industries in Kenya. There's also, of course, a huge flower industry that has both local and, or sorry, uh, national and international players. Um, there's mining firms. I listed the Athi River Mining Company. And then local. To say again what I said earlier, we consider farmers, local, small-scale private sector. They're very important actors. Also, there's small businesses in, in these rural areas. There might be um, small agribusinesses. There might be charcoal making. There's all kinds of things going on. And then also important for, for Kenya and for Tanzania and for many areas in Africa and Asia, there's a lot of tourism entities. And some of these might be very small scale too, where they're working, they're local people with, who are engaged in their livelihoods and um, tourism things. So I included that one as well. So if we can go on to the next slide. So now we're on to civil society. And I look forward to hearing where everybody is from when we have the discussion. But basically, I think this is the one that we're all most familiar with. We, are all, we all know the environmental and development NGOs that are working internationally all over the world, no matter where you are. I'm pretty sure there's one of these in your, or in your country working, if not dozens. Um, there's also national level organizations. In a lot of countries, out there, there's a vibrant um, civil society sector. There's a lot of different organizations. They may be focused on some very specific subject, very specific 
area or they might be quite broad. But there's many of them, and again, I look forward to hearing who you're working with, who you actually work with, and who are your partners. And then local, there's a lot of um, smaller organizations, grassroots organizations, farmers associations, um, women's groups, religious, there's just a myriad of these different groups. And uh, this list actually for local, I took from a uh, Kenya Standard newspaper article from just a few months ago, and they used exactly that expression that this is one of the most vibrant in Africa. And I think in a way this makes our work easier, in fact, that we have this, this really strong network of organizations that we can call on the partner. And, sorry, was, were you Stacy? Stacy, I... Um, okay, I'd be happy to. I want to add, again, that I've only been there for six months, so I'm not quite as expert on Kenya as I should be, but as we talk, I'd like to hear what other people say. But basically, I think um, Kenya in the last year, they've had elections a year ago. They, they had a very good result compared to the last elections, and they really moved forward. There was a lot of restructuring. Um, it's a very, very uh, dynamic economy. I think it's, it's the engine of East Africa, and I think a lot of countries are looking at how Kenya has proceeded to see how they can develop it. They have a lot of issues in terms of um, natural resources. They have a very um, strong natural resource space, but it's also being um, utilized in development. There's a lot of outside development flowing into the country. Um, I would say their regulatory system is fairly strong, but in every country there's, there's um, gaps and there's problems to exploit. So I think that it's a good case study country in that way in that there's a lot going on mostly good, but some areas for improvement. So I think it, it will be for the ELD, it's, it's our first country that we're going to do stakeholder engagement. We will do consultations in in Nairobi at the national level, I think it's in three weeks time, and then or four weeks time, and then we, we also have um, one in a county, in our county, so it will be really interesting to hear how they see it, and maybe at some point when we have a further discussion I'll have more to say about how it works in Kenya and, and what they're facing, but working through this county structure I think is going to be a very interesting process for us. And again, as we um, as we go to the discussion, I really look forward to hearing the arrangements in the other countries. So um, if we can go on from the civil society slide. So these are some examples of, of civil society in Kenya. Um, I have to apologize. I've when I listed the UN ones, I did not list UNDP, and in fact, UNDP is a key partner in my working group, so I have to hang my head in shame that that's not listed there. And my apologies to Ann Jupiter that she's my, my partner in crime on these consultations. But there's also, of course, the UN compound in Nairobi, and there's all kinds of UN agencies there. I only listed a few of the um, other agencies, but there, there's a very large NGO sector there, so you could probably fill in a number of other organizations and, and fill up the whole page with people working in Kenya. Um, the same with National. I've listed a couple that I thought would be relevant to our work, but as we go out and do our, our stakeholder meetings in the local areas and also at the national level, we will fill this in and we will have a, a much more complete list. We need to map out these groups, figure out who's working in, in what areas and what's relevant to our work. And then the same with local, we have all of these smaller groups to look at and this is one of the advantages of, of doing the consultation at the county level in NARAC. We'll have a chance to find out who's working there, what they're working on, and what their issues are. And one of the things that we hope that comes out of, of the ELD initiative is a toolkit for different users for the private sector, for civil society, and for um, the government, and this is our chance to get input from these different groups and find out what it is they're looking for, what they need, what their concerns are. So this this is sort of a, a to be continued. Once we, once we move farther on, I think it will be really interesting to share our results. So we can go to the next slide. And so here is the last group, other international, and this is the one I think that we all are very familiar with. A lot of us are scientists or academics. A lot of us are from um, research institutes or development organizations, environmental, even community, community based organizations. So as I said earlier, I think that we're very good at talking to this community. We're all members of it. We all come from sort of the same culture or background. So I included them separately. I think that we have a very important part to play in this process. Especially for an organization like SEI, we look a lot at evidence-based policy and so it's it's partly about how to translate our research results into, into policy-relevant information to 
to the stakeholders, both the private sector and the government, in a way that they can they can make sense. Sorry, my screen just went down and blank. So next slide. So I, I just want to, because we're at a half an hour now, and I really look forward to the discussion, so I just want to briefly go through the last two slides. And again, stakeholder engagement methodologies, I think a lot of us have, have tried these different types of, of um, ways of, of reaching out to the different groups. I think it depends very much on who you're working with, who you want to talk to, what kind of input you want to get. Um, I think consultations are very, very useful. There's a, a really good chance to talk in a small group, which is what we're going to do in, in Kenya, eventually in the other countries where we're doing consultations. I think workshops just had, as I said to some of the people who joined us earlier, we had the private sector workshop here in Bonn yesterday and today. And to really brainstorm with the private sector was not only really interesting and kind of an eye-opener to us, I think it was also for them to hear some of the things that we were working on. Um, there was a point where we surveyed exactly what our tools were. This was in the group of, of scientists and geos, kind of the other group. And we were all listing different tools that we had that we used. And the facilitator kept saying, can that be used by the private sector? And we kept saying, well, yeah. But in a lot of cases, it hadn't been. And I, I think when we presented back to the plenary, the private sector was also interested in some of these methodologies that we've developed. And then, of course, then they had their turn to explain to us what they were doing, what they had been working on, what technologies they were using, and it was really kind of interesting to have this dialogue. So I'm a big fan of workshops, whether they're private sector, whether they're the government. It's a real it's a real chance to brainstorm together and share and get to learn a lot about everybody's um, concerns. And then I also have focus group discussions. Again, any of us who are scientists have probably done so many of these, but this is a, a good chance you can put together a group of people who are very similar. You can put put together all female group, you can put together communities, and you really get a chance to um, to hear their concerns and, and hear what they would like to see, what their input is. So I highly recommend these. And then one-on-one -on -one meetings, if you're meeting with the ministry, or particularly with someone who's very senior, maybe you're meeting with someone who's the head of a, of a private sector firm or a minister, then a one-on-one -on -one meeting can be very good in terms of getting really good feedback from what the stakeholders at the top want. So I think there's a variety of methodologies, methodologies that we use and that we can draw on. And I look forward to hearing in the discussion what you guys have to say about these particular types. And if you have like something very innovative that we, that's not on this list that doesn't get covered by this, I would love to hear about that too. And then the last slide is about communication. So we can't stop once we've gathered the input and we've done our research out, because we have to really think about how we reach our different stakeholders. And I think we need very different um, very different research outputs depending on who we're talking to. And with the government, for my organization, whenever we do policy briefs, there are only two pages. They can never be longer than two pages, front and back. It's usually got a lot of pictures and diagrams. It's not solid text. I think the shorter the better. The more senior the person is, the less likely they are to read very much of your text at all. So I think that's really important in terms of reaching the government, but then we also remember that there's technical staff, there's People working underneath these senior officials, and, and this policy brief should be backed up by a much longer working paper or a technical brief that that staff would read and maybe even you know come back with questions or further summarize it to the people in their organization. So I think we have to be very careful how we tailor stuff for the government and that we use the right language, that we don't fill it with scientific jargon or economic language that maybe might make people sort of switch off and not really hear our message. Uh, I think it's similar with the private sector. The more senior person you're targeting, the probably the less text you want, the busier she or he is going to be, and the, and the more you want to make it short and snappy. But again, there's going to be people working farther down in the organization or even potentially the person that you've aimed it at who wants the more background information, who wants longer work. There's also case studies we can offer that came out of the, uh, out of the private sector workshop about sharing case studies about what worked in other regions and other sectors. Um, other kinds of information sharing platforms, it doesn't all have to be written, particularly with the private sector, this interaction I think is very important. And I'm kind of interested in the idea about seeing what the private sector is doing in the field rather than just talking at the headquarters level or with people working in, in, in headquarters, but actually going out and seeing what they're doing in the local level. Um, civil society, so here I'm thinking more of, of community level. 
And I got this very good idea of multimedia from the ELD communications person, Sarah O'Dara. She was saying multimedia, it could be anything from um, a radio broadcast, it could be a flyer, it could be, if you're aiming at a younger audience, it could be some sort of cartoon-based message, it could be um, a drama. I know with some of the AIDS education, they've been very successful putting on sort of mini plays. So I think with civil society, the sky's the limit. You, they could have the full spectrum. They might be interested in the, some of the things that you share with the other groups, but then we might have really innovative ways. And of course, the civil society in, in some countries, we have to make very sure that we're using the right languages, that we're using the right um, the right mechanism to get through to them, to, and, and again, to get their feedback. And then lastly, the others, the academics, I think we're really good at this. We all write journal articles. We all go to conferences and make presentations. We all do project reports, working papers. So there's a lot of things that we can share among ourselves. We all know how um, how how we speak to each other. So I think this one is actually our, our easiest task. So I think that's the last slide. Is that correct, Claudia? It is. It is. So we've is, used is. a little over half an hour. So this is the chance to have the conversation that I've really been looking forward to. So if Claudia is okay, can we just open it up to, to questions? Yes, we have, yes, we have taken, taken some questions, questions from the chat box because the, the chat box runs very fast. We have uh, three questions um, that I'm going to read and you uh, may want to reply briefly and then we'll open the microphones for all of you who want to um, share uh, their questions with us. Um, in the question number one, in East Africa specifically, how do the needs of the private sector affect the land degradation initiatives? What would you say are probably useful synergies and MNC might consider a multinational corporation, MNC. So, Stacy. So, if I can start with that first one, I think that's yes. a really good question. Um, I think the private sector, talking to them today, they look at it in two ways. Land degradation is a source of risk to them. It's a, a land is an asset for them, and if there's land degradation, then their asset is underperforming. But in degraded areas, it's also an opportunity to bring more land back into into use and to renew the land. So I think that in some ways, the multinational corporations and, and even large national organizations or companies working with natural resources, they have a very big stake in make, making sure that land degradation is is fought and that, um, that they don't contribute to more land degradation. So I think in a sense, they're sort of our natural allies. I don't think that we maybe realize that, and I think sometimes they're painted as the um, the enemy. But this is really something that we need to work in partnership because they have the same aims as we do. It's it's not in their interest to degrade the land because they might use it until it's it's finished, but then they've lost their ability to um, produce. So I think there's actually a lot of synergies between what these companies are doing, and I think there's a role for civil society there too because it might be the case that these companies don't have all the information about what they're doing in terms of how it's affecting the local community users, how it's affecting ecosystem services that are maybe being relied on by the households. So I think that's another important role for civil society and even for the academic and research community to provide to make sure that all the uses of the land are being considered and that all the stakeholders' needs are, are being factored in. I hope that, okay. I'm not sure who asked that question, but I hope that answers it. Yes, we can uh, add to that uh, in the open mic uh, session. Question number two, uh, you presented a lot of stakeholders on various levels. Do you find that horizontal and vertical collaboration is lacking between the different uh, ministries and the different levels? Um, I think that it, it's really dependent on individual countries. In some countries, for example, I've worked in Rwanda, there's very good coordination across the country at all levels. I, the larger countries, it's, it's much more difficult and it probably depends on the structure too. I think in Kenya with this new county system, because there's only two levels, I would it would be my prediction that you would have much less problems with, um, with coordination between the different levels. Um, in terms of bridging the gap, um, I think the 
government communicating with local farmers is actually a real issue. Um, I don't think that in some countries they actually know what the farmers need and that even more importantly that what the farmers, what they want to communicate ever makes it up to the capital. Um, so I think it, it really depends on the country. But I, I think that's something that's really important. You have the policy makers in, in Dar es Salaam or in Nairobi or Accra or whatever not aware of what's actually happening at the lower levels. And if they don't have the local government structure in place, extension officers and, and community leaders who are reporting this back, then I do think that you have a real problem. Okay, so that's within the country. And we also have question three of how does that work between the countries? How does the county structure in Kenya deal with the international collaboration problems? Uh, many countries have share water. Uh, how, how does that work? I'm not sure I can comment at this point about the county structure in terms of international collaboration. I don't know if Ann Jubner is with us, but if she is, she might be able to make a comment on that. She's a, she works with me on the, on the outreach working group and she's been in Kenya a long time, so she might have a better insight into that. In terms of, of um, international collaboration, I think that's actually quite difficult. If you look at the Nile Basin Initiative, it's a very good example where it's, a, it's an excellent organization that's trying very hard, but they're having a lot of, um, it's, it's very easy to have a lot of conflict in this situation. And I think it's something that's going to continue to be a problem. If you look at the, to go to water, if you look at the transboundary basins in Africa, it's, it's an issue all across Africa. And you have countries that are stronger than others that are upstream, downstream, and there's, there's different activities that are ongoing. And I think it's, uh, it's actually something that, that really, I think, could be good for ELD and in general for, for these transboundary organizations. If you look at Nile Basin, if you look at SADC, if you look at EAC, if some of the um, sort of super regional organizations could get involved, I think it would be very effective. But right now, I think there's still quite a bit of problem on that. But I can't really answer how the county structure is going to play out on that. But maybe in the discussion, someone can, can offer their insights from Kenya. OK. Um, so here's some feedback on uh, how the, the, the county structures may work out or uh, how international collaboration or co uh, cooperation between uh, different levels of stakeholders is playing out. I think that we um, may now open the mics, microphones um, for that. Uh, if you want to raise a question uh, in this discussion, uh, we would first ask you to raise your hand and uh, you do that um, by uh, clicking on that little hand icon underneath the participant list. Um, if you look at the participant list uh, underneath, you see the little icons representing the number of participants. And next to it, oh, oh sorry, it's, it's above. Uh, above the participants list. I'm looking at the uh, moderator's view. Above, in the very uh, uh, um, top left corner, you, you see that uh, hand. Raise your hand and then we will give you the microphone over to be able to talk. You see that uh, hand in the little uh, on top of the uh, attendees list in the left uh, corner, you see that hope, uh, that hand. If you click on that, um, we will be able to hand uh, the microphone over to you. Top-down versus bottom-up approach in terms of ownership, what would you say? Trouble hearing. There we go. Can you hear me now? Claudia, can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
Okay, so um, uh, it was top down versus bottom up. Obviously, if, if you, the ideal situation would be to start at, at the grassroots level if that's where your or if your project is starting there or your research to start at that level and start from there and then I think then consult with the um, the higher level. I think that's the question. I'm not sure that I understood exactly, but maybe Raul could explain a little bit more what he's asking. Sorry, I, I attempted to answer that question by saying I wasn't actually familiar with that particular methodology, and I asked Emma if she wanted to make a comment on that. Um, I'm, we may have to get back to that uh, question. Um, and uh, maybe get Emma on to, uh, she won't be able to talk. So I, I suggest that we uh, take up this question and uh, maybe refer to it in a later meeting or reply to it in the forum. And uh, I would turn on to the next participant. Please, Santiago, hand over the microphone. Um, to the next uh, person will answer that question in uh, the forum and there's also um, more information in that in the course script at a later time. Okay, was uh, with, uh, when you have so many stakeholders uh, and you can't uh, address them all at the same time, so, uh, what would be the criteria to uh, and to develop a timeline in which uh, to address those stakeholders? So, if, if I understand the question correctly, you're saying that you have a, a large group of stakeholders and you have to you want to engage them all and you want to uh, drop a timeline. So my advice would be to look at the aims of your project or your research and see who's most directly affected and ideally at, at close, most closely related to your area and then work back from there. And in terms of a timeline, I, I think it depends on, on your project and on what kind of um, resources you have. But ideally, I would start with the people who are most directly affected by the work. And then when you start with them, you can also you can also sort of query them on who else is involved. So that way you can kind of find some of the people that you might have missed. Okay, so the criteria would be uh, who is closest uh, to the case, and uh, from so work from the center uh, uh, further uh, further out. Okay, um, can we take the next uh, question? Ivan from Peru. What do you find most difficult in working with stakeholders? What are, what are some of the challenges you have been experiencing? I would say the biggest challenge is that you go in thinking that it's going to go a certain way, that you already kind of understand the problem, and then the first time that you start consulting with the community or with uh, maybe a senior official, you realize that you've got the question kind of wrong, and if you've already talked to some people, you wish that you could go back and ask additional questions. So I think that the more you consult, you actually get more questions and you get um, a little bit more confused. It gets more complicated. So I think you have to go in with a very open mind. I think you have to be very patient in listening and make sure that you don't bring in your own preconceived notions because I think that 
it's very hard to understand what's going on at a local level, especially if if you're working, even in the country that you're based, if you're going into a, a, a local area to work, it's really hard to understand what's going on. So I think you have to be very patient. I think you have to be very thorough. And again, I think the best way to make sure that you're finding everybody is just to listen to what people are saying and, and use the snowballing technique where if someone says you should talk to this person and then you keep asking who else do I need to talk to and try to undercover, un uncover, sorry, not undercover, uncover everyone that, that you need to speak to. I think it's actually a real challenge. Um, I'd also like to say, I mean, it would be great to hear what some of the other people have to say about what they've done in terms of stakeholder engagement, what's really worked, what's been a problem. Um, any, any suggestions about that would be really interesting to share. So any, somebody would like to share some experience in working with stakeholders? Raise your hand and then we'll open the microphone. Ephraim from Rome. Uh, Santiago, please hand over the yes, the microphone to Ephraim. So any experience in working with stakeholders? Ephra uh, is uh, asking from his um, experience in working in Indonesia, what are the success stories uh, about uh, or uh, success stories in talking to uh, stakeholders? Maybe you can give us some examples of your uh, work with them. Um, yes, I think a, a very good example from a recent project that I worked on, this was a project for um, the EU, FP7, and we were looking at developing tools for managing um, climate change with health in impacts. And w one of the first things that we did, the whole aim of the project was to produce um, new decision support tools for the stakeholders. And I was involved, I led the, the working group on stakeholder engagement. And one of the first things that we did was survey um, all the stakeholders in the five countries, it was the EAC countries, East African community, and we found out that virtually no one was using tools. <laughs> so right from the start we had already had an idea of which tool that we wanted to use. It was um, a web-based tool, and we found out that it wasn't actually going to be meet the needs of the stakeholders at all. So in a sense, I guess one of the lessons from that particular project is that maybe we actually want to consult the stakeholders when we are designing our project. Um, in the end, I think we've worked it out. We've produced new um, types of, uh, they're still decision support tools, but they're not, they don't look anything what we envisioned. So I think one of the things that I would say is when you're developing proposals or research ideas, you almost need to consult before you even start to make sure that you're on the right track. Okay, thanks. Um, then, uh, he was asking how do you uh, involve stakeholders at a very early stage in the process and also how do you bridge cultural gaps between uh, people representing uh, multinational corporations and uh, local, uh, local people? Florian, I think that's a great question. I think that's one that we all struggle with. And one of the ways that we have resolved this is we work, SEI works primarily through local partners. And I think it's essential that you have a strong relationship, a strong network of local partners that you can call on. And if you're working in a specific country and you have that in place, and you're also familiar with the, the context of your larger company, then I think that you can sort of bridge the gap yourself because you understand the sensibilities on both sides. And then hopefully as the project um, progresses, then you, you come closer and closer to meeting and both sides sort of gain from the interaction. But um, I just want to say one thing about um, consulting during the proposal stage, that um, one of my first positions was with a local NGO in Belize in Central America. And um, we often had organizations come down to perform their consultations, and I put air quotes around consultations, because basically they already knew what they wanted their project to be and they would meet with the communities and they would meet with our, our marine conservation NGO and they would count those as consultations. So I guess my other um, big issue would be when you do go to the field and consult, make sure that you listen to what is being said. And again, I think it's really important to go in with an open mind. And I think if you look at the example that Florian gave, 
it's the same actually I would say working both with the local communities hopefully you have a partner who can help you understand their needs and how they're reacting to the proposals from the other side but you also want to go in with an open mind to your coca-cola or your large firm because you want to hear what they're saying as well and I think it is really tricky to bridge that gap I think all of us tend to be on one side or the other at at the time I was in Belize, I was very much on the side of the local community, and I don't know that I always heard what the other side was saying, but then it goes both ways. So I think it's, it's a really tricky position to be in, but it's also very rewarding. So thank you, Florian, for that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ravan will tell you, let me repeat the question. This was a question f uh, about uh, how uh, you identify stakeholders and how you assist them in their capacity uh, of taking part in that uh, stakeholder pro process and uh, the question of whether stakeholders do uh, need uh, or how important is their knowledge uh, in, in that stakeholder process. Stacy, thanks. Thank, thank you for that question. Um, I think that's a really important point that in some cases you do have an issue with maybe you have a, a, a new issue that's come up or something that the stakeholders have not dealt with before or you're proposing a project that they're they haven't seen before and I think sometimes capacity building is very important or you're not going to get any quality um, engagement with the local partner and I think that that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second half of the question? I think I missed the second half. Whether you, uh, what kind of knowledge do they need uh, to take part in the process? I, I, obviously it depends on the project and I think here if you have good civil society organizations in, in the local areas that can be very helpful in terms of assessing who the correct partner might be and who, who has the capacity and maybe if there's still some additional needs who can help build that capacity that, so that they can be a full partner. So again, I think it's, it's important to have a strong network. I think we all have, um, we all see projects and proposals that we want to do that might suggest a country that we're not even familiar with and I think that makes it very difficult to try to go in and, um, and do a good project when you're starting from scratch with a new partner. I think it's really important to have um, local partners. Maybe you don't have a partner in the local area, but maybe you have one in the capital or in a nearby area. It's really important to know and to trust who you're working with. And I think that's an, a good question in terms of making sure that you've picked the right partner who has, or sorry, the right stakeholder who has capacity to actually effectively contribute to the, to the project. Uh-huh. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any more speakers? Any more volunteers to raise a question for Stacy? Uh, here's Lebaka. Microphone, please, for Lebaka. Well, it was a little shaky, so um, uh, as far as I, uh, from what I understood, it was uh, the corporate sector damaging natural resources and uh, the, the government uh, not acting uh, and uh, water resources involved. Uh, maybe you could comment on uh, corporate sector and relationship to government. Sorry, Claudia, could you repeat that one more time before I reply? There was a the question uh, I couldn't I didn't uh, fully get it, but it, there was a question about the corporate sector damaging natural resources and the uh, the, um, the government reacting to it or not really reacting to it. So, so if I understand correctly, it's the private sector causing land degradation or other problems with natural resources, and and the national government not responding. So I would say. That in, in that case, you would want to somehow um, empower the local stakeholders to see what's happening on the ground, and hopefully there's effective mechanism to transmit this information back to the regional level or to the national level, whatever is needed. And if there isn't, then I think this is a, a great opportunity for an outside organization 
to step in and try to help give a voice. But I also think it's very important to talk to the private sector because, as, as I said earlier, it's not really in their interest to um, to degrade the land, to just use up the natural resources without um, without any any um, concern because that that's affecting their business model. So if that's happening, then either they're not aware of the problems they're causing, or you have a problem with the governance at the national level not stepping in to do something. So I think the first point would be to talk to um, to make sure that you understand what the local stakeholders issue is and then talk to the private sector company or the multinational whatever company we're talking about and find out if they're actually aware of what's happening before you um, take it to the to the national government and, and hopefully if it comes to that then there would be um, effective reaction from the national government to stop that. Okay, so as uh, the, the, the business be able to raise more of those questions um, at this point, I would like to uh, thank Stacy very much uh, for her presentation on stakeholder involvement in uh, Kenya. So clap your hands if you enjoyed the presentation. We will be available um, for a little while after this uh, talk for um, more questions. Stacey will also be available for answering um, questions in the forum. We'll put up all the information in um, in the forum and um, you, I, from last week I saw that there was uh, a lot of discussions uh, starting uh, when we put up that uh, summary. So we stay online uh, for more questions, but for those of you who have to leave, I would uh, say uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Stacy. We'll see you next week um, for Sarah, Marianne, Odera's talk uh, about ELD engagement with uh, the private sector. I am thanking the GIZ team, Santiago, Volker, Esther, uh, Natalie and others who uh, helped uh, with this uh, chat today. And before you leave, I would ask you to uh, give us your opinion in uh, the poll. Um, how did you like uh, this live event? Uh, please click uh, on the poll and uh, hope to see you next week. We'll stay online. Hope to see you next week um, for our business um, stakeholder uh, live event and see you online, uh, see you in the forum when uh, we, I saw that many teams are already active, people asking questions in the forum, so um, stay tuned, see you. Bye-bye, see you next week, and it was nice having you aboard. I'd like to say thank you to everyone, and please feel free to email me or contact me. I'd love to hear both your, your questions and any comments or experiences that you'd like to share, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Stacy.